When I first played Sunless Sea, I did not get it. The main reason I picked the game up upon its release for the PS4 back in 2018 was because I'd heard that it contained Lovecraftian horror elements. As a fanatic of games like Bloodborne and Darkest Dungeon, I was ravenous for any other games, with even a faint whiff of the Eldritch. Not to mention my love for other works which explore weird ideas about places and items with anomalous properties, things like SCP and Roadside Picnic. And so on the 28th of August 2018, I purchased Sunless Sea and started it up, not really knowing anything further about what type of game it was. And boy, was I in for a wild ride. Except not really, because I thought it was shit. I'm ashamed to say that my first foray into the Sunless Sea was not an enjoyable one. I was instantly turned off by the game's presentation. After a super long load screen, I clumsily made my way through the various screens of text which assaulted my eyes, not to get too dramatic or anything. Not really taking in what I was reading before finally managing to take a look at my ship. Ahoy! Unfortunately, I didn't really know what I was supposed to do, where I was supposed to go, or what fragments were. I sailed my ship north a bit, discovering Hunter's Keep, and upon docking, was greeted with more text with various choices available to me. I navigated my way through these, and was rewarded with one ex terror, but also a tale of terror. What? Directly after, I sailed further north, and was assailed by a colony of bats, only to be nearly destroyed because I couldn't figure out how to target an enemy on the bloody PS4 controller. It's fair to say my initial short stint as a Z Captain was marred by confusion and frustration, and so I shut the game off and declared it to be, as we say in Scotland, a shiter. Did I give it a fair chance? No. Did I actually read through the in-game tutorials? No. Did I realise that the game had an in-game map? Absolutely not. Not even until about six hours into my much later attempt at the game. My only real defence here was that the PS4 port of the game has a far less user-friendly interface, and playing the game on PC for the first time with recording footage, and it is night and day. But regardless, I shut Sunless Sea off and wouldn't give it much of a second thought for over two years. Then, one afternoon in September 2020, being bereft of anything interesting to play at the time, I looked through my library of PS4 games and spotted Sunless Sea. Ah, oh, fuck it, I thought. Let's give it another shake. And boy, was I glad that I did. Because after close to 200 hours of play, it has since become one of my favourite ever games. So much so, that I wanted it to be the subject of my first video. And so without further ado, let's take off. Broadly speaking, Sunless Sea revolves around exploration, trade, combat, and text-based storytelling. As a Sea Captain, you travel around a vast underground body of water known as the Untersea, battling pirates and beasts and visiting far-flung ports for profit, intelligence, and adventure. The game differs from most others in that there's not a central driving plot. Rather, you choose your own ambition at the beginning and work towards it at your own pace. In fact, you could ignore your character's main quest entirely if you really want to. Exploration in Sunless Sea is primarily driven and encouraged by the Port Report system. Port Reports effectively function as rewards for visiting a location, and can be produced repeatedly upon subsequent visits to that location. They can then be traded into the London Admiralty for money and fuel. Although the game has an extensive variety of weird and wonderful cargo to be salvaged and traded, the Port Report system consistently provides an engaging incentive to venture farther out from London to discover new ports. It makes it so that even if a voyage wasn't particularly fruitful in terms of quest rewards or cargo, you can still recoup a portion of your losses by handing in new reports, learning a little bit more about the location at the same time. But profit isn't the only reason you'll want to explore the Untersea, because it's difficult to fully describe just how rich this world is, and intrigue creativity, atmosphere, and above all.
The world of sunless sea is a weird one, and the natural laws of the undersea differ greatly to the laws on the surface. This is primarily due to the absence of natural light from the judgments, the stars. You see, light is law, and the absence of it leads to some very different rules. In fact, denizens of the undersea are so conditioned to the absence of sunlight that mere exposure to it can kill them on the spot, a condition which many of us here in Scotland are all too familiar with. The world of the undersea, in a particular fall in London, was first introduced in the browser game of the same name back in 2009, which is in fact still being updated with new content even now in 2022, although admittedly I yet to try it out. It would be fair to say, however, that the most compelling aspect of Sunless Sea is its world building. In fact, I've never played a game that so nails that distinctive flavour of weirdness that makes you want to just keep playing, discovering more and more about the world, its locations and its inhabitants. With outlandish locations like the Grand Geode, the towering ice forms of Frostfound, or the desolate and mysterious King Eater's Castle, Sunless Sea's beautiful artwork Rich writing and dark atmosphere contribute to a uniquely compelling world, complete with sentient clay men, cities of exiles built within the still living remains of an interstellar crab, and above all. The soundtrack is also incredible, with particular tracks playing depending on what region of the map you're in. I love the way Wolfstack Lights plays when you're approaching London after a long voyage, looking to offload your port reports and perhaps some crates of approved romantic literature. I adore the whole soundtrack, but here are a few standouts. While the world and writing is undoubtedly the heart of the game, its arms and legs are the exploration and combat. To put it simply, combat in Sunless Sea is very basic. You essentially wait until the charge meter of your weapon is filled up, and then you fire. You don't even really need to aim, as long as the enemy is within your cone of vision, the shot will hit, although if you want to risk firing before you're fully charged up, there's a chance you'll miss, so a little bit of risk reward there. There are some different weapon types, some of which require ammunition, but honestly that's pretty much all there really is to the combat mechanics. They're simple, but serviceable. Due to combat being so simple however, many encounters are quite easy to cheese. If it's a melee focused fight with an angler crab, lifeberg or bound shark, as long as you're near constantly backing up while maintaining firing range, they'll rarely be able to actually land a hit on you, providing your ship is equipped with a half decent engine. This one simple trick nearly trivialises half of the game's enemies, even the more intimidating ones to the far east of the map, like the Warm Flukes. Good god are these things weird. Don't get me wrong though, you'll definitely want to be cautious of who you pick a fight with in the early game due to your low HP and weak starting weapon. Here's me fleeing a damn crab because the game bugged out and wouldn't let me target it. Once you can afford a decent ship with higher HP and an additional gun slot though, it's game on, crab. You also get into frequent battles with all manner of enemy pirates and dreadnoughts who can fire back at you, but the strategy for these things doesn't really differ much compared to when you're fighting beasts. The main difference is that you'll take some unavoidable damage from their guns. Some of these units are formidable though, and you'll want to avoid them until you're a good bit into the game. Damage won't be your only worry while out exploring the Untersea though, because you will be near constantly gaining terror. 
Terror goes up when fighting enemies, while engaged in text sections, and even when you're just out on the open seas. It's unavoidable. This can be mitigated by keeping your ship's lights on, which decreases the rate at which terror increases, but then that'll cause your fuel to burn faster. Sometimes you can afford this, and sometimes you can't. The key is to be strategic and to know when to turn it off and on. If your terror gets to 100, your crew might mutiny, in which case your captain's gubbed. Game over. Unless you're really reckless or haven't yet got to grips with the game's mechanics though, it's not that easy to get all the way to 100. There are places where you can pay echoes to reduce a bit of terror here and there, and whenever you return to London with your terror above 50, it'll get reduced down to 50, although each time this happens, you'll accumulate nightmares, giving you various negative interactions and events while out at sea. Terror is a great mechanic for keeping you on your toes, because it's always going up. It's easy to become complacent midway through a long voyage while your meter is still fairly low, but things can get very dicey if you stray a bit too far from the lights of London without paying close attention to your terror meter. I've had to do many a frantic beeline back home after a chance encounter with a fluke. There are also other things which can cause your terror to increase. Let's talk money. Bucks. A major driver for doing near anything in the game is money. Echoes to be precise. Echoes are used to purchase new, more powerful ships with better stats, more gun slots, and a larger cargo hold. You can also fit your ship with ever more powerful weapons, engines, and lamps to turn your ship into the most formidable vessel on the Untersee. Each ship has its different pros and cons, but to be honest, you're best ignoring about half of the ships on offer. A ship with a cargo hold capacity of 120 might look attractive, but not when it moves at a snail's pace and takes an eternity to kill anything. And sure, you may want to save up for the Escatalog es class dreadnought, so you can brag to your family and friends. But it also moves so slow that you'll have to fit it with an expensive fuel guzzling engine, which in turn means stocking up on a ton of fuel and supplies every time you venture out on a voyage, costing a ton of echoes and partially filling up your cargo hold. As soon as you can afford it, I recommend going with the frigate. It's sick, and it's all you'll need. And it's not what you can pass on your ship to your next captain anyway, right? But we'll get to that. Sunless Sea is also an RPG, which means there are stats. You've got Iron, which increases the damage of your attacks, Mirrors, which allows your weapon to charge faster, Veils, which decreases the range at which enemies can spot you, Hearts, which primarily helps with terror-related skill checks, and then finally, there's Pages, which decreases the number of fragments required to gain a secret. You gain fragments from spotting landmarks out at sea, completing quests, encountering new enemies, by passing skill checks. Get enough fragments, and you'll gain a secret. God damn, I love that sound. Secrets are your primary way of gaining stats throughout the game, and you do this by chatting with your officers, introducing colourful characters like the Nacreous Outcast, the Haunted Doctor, the bandaged... The bandaged... What's on you? Seriously though, there are a huge array of officers to recruit into your crew, each with their own stat bonuses, backstories, and quest lines. Your stats will also help with the many skill checks throughout the game, and so leveling them up is important. There are also a bunch of special legacy items, which can be obtained through various quest lines, which give you and your progenitors substantial stat bonuses upon death. And that brings us to a core feature of the game, death. Permadeath, to be specific. Although it can be switched off, the intended way to play Sunless Sea is with permadeath left on. When your captain dies, you lose your ship, your levels, most of your echoes, most of your equipment, all your progress on any quests, and all your trade goods. Pretty rough, right? Well yes, but I like it that way and so does the game because it features a ton of different ways to make the journey easier for your progenitors. Why not write an ironclad will so that you can pass on your lodgings? Accumulate a collection of captivating treasures, convert them into heirlooms so your next in line can sell them off and afford a decent ship right from the get-go. Not to mention the aforementioned stat-boosting legacy items which you can pass on to your next captain, some of which are only obtainable by ending your current captain's playthrough through obscure quests. 
When I first got into Sunless Sea, I wasn't too hot on this whole system of restarting playthroughs with new captains, because a massive chunk of the game involves reading. Why would I want to go through the same quests with a new captain when I just did them with my last captain, or the one before that, leading to reading and rereading the same passages of text time and time again? While this is undoubtedly an issue with the game, the quality of writing really does do a lot to mitigate this, not to mention the sheer volume of it. Even now, on newer playthroughs, I still find myself discovering interactions, events and characters that I've never seen before. I've got to be honest though, that towards the end game, I do find myself often skipping through text, so I can pick up a port report or a particular item. Usually when you get to this stage, it's time to put the game down for a while. While the game's progression and mechanics in terms of stats and equipment and combat are undoubtedly satisfying, they very quickly become stale without the due appreciation for the delicious writing to give it all context and purpose. It's also important to mention that the layout of the map changes for each playthrough, which is yet another attempt at keeping subsequent playthroughs feeling somewhat fresh. Although most of your time in Sunless Sea will be spent exploring, trading and doing side quests, your captain will also have a main goal, called an ambition, to fulfil, selected at the start of your playthrough. These tend to be very involved and require a lot of work and resources from all around the sea to fulfil, and their nature is far more personal to your captain when compared to almost all the other quests and interactions in the game, which tend to be far more focused on the quirks and ambitions of others. I found that the best way to go about completing these ambitions was to just do them while doing other things. Beelining to every main quest location can kind of make them feel a little bit tedious rather than rewarding. Some with C is a game to take your time with. The Submariner DLC also introduced a brand new ambition which I highly recommend trying out. It's excellent. Plus, the game sports a couple of secret ambitions. In fact, you may have even heard of one of these due to how notoriously difficult it is to achieve, presenting the Uttermost East ambition requiring really high stats, a ton of super rare items, and the requirement that you literally sail off the edges of the map, fucking up your ship in various fun ways and leaving you close to death. No thanks. The Submariner DLC was released in 2016, a year and a half after the base game, and if you enjoyed Sunless Sea, you'll enjoy the DLC. After completing a new quest at Port Carnelian, your ship will gain the ability to submerge under the Untersea, where you're now free to explore several odd and interesting new locations. Seriously, there's some weird shit down here. An abominable menagerie of new underwater beasts also await your ship beneath the waves, and while these don't really do much to increase combat difficulty or build upon the game's existing combat mechanics, other than a kind of pointless O2 meter, it's nice to have some more stuff to fight. Like this cutie. The fantastic quality of writing and atmosphere present in the base game is here in spades, and as mentioned, the new ambition the DLC introduces is also well worth doing for the story. Sunless Sea is a unique, atmospheric, satisfying and beautiful game. By no means is it the best game in the world in terms of gameplay mechanics, not even close but the world building, the writing, the music and the incredible atmosphere make it an immersive joy to play, and I love it. Sunless Sea is not for everyone, but if it looks like it might be for you, then it might really be for you. It might just become one of your favourites. And so after watching my video, if you've got the inclination, why not pick the game up? But please, if you do, just steer well clear of the...